Good morning, everybody. It's uh, really nice to be back uh, in this beautiful space uh, again. I've been here uh, a couple of times in the past, or many times uh, in the pews, and a couple of times up here. And uh, uh, really, one of my favorite churches in terms of kind of having that lovely mix of intimacy and grandeur. Uh, so this is called um, Ten Lessons from a Tiger. Um, uh, since I uh, wrote The Tiger, I've been just thinking a lot about how they live and how we live and some really important similarities and differences uh, that, that have occurred to me. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, more about that as I go on, but I want to start uh, with a tiger story. Uh, in 2007, I went to the Russian Far East uh, to investigate a series of attacks by a Siberian tiger. Uh, the Far East uh, is a tough place. It borders China and uh, North Korea. Winter temperatures can drop to minus 40. In summer, it rains. And the bugs are brutal, uh, never mind the tigers. Uh, the attacks uh, took place in the Bikin Valley, where prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, logging and fur trapping uh, had been the main industries. In fact, this region really reminded me a lot of British Columbia uh, in terms of its remoteness from the capital and the way many of the inhabitants uh, used it. Um, but when I got there uh, in 2007, you know, six years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the villages reminded me of Depression-era mining towns. Uh, deep poverty, despair, and alcoholism uh, were rampant. And in order to survive, the local people had essentially fallen back on the bounty of the forest, uh, which they called Mother Taiga. And when I saw this, I understood better why an unemployed logger named Vladimir Markov might risk hunting a tiger, especially when less than 100 kilometers away on the Chinese border, there was a new and thriving illegal trade uh, in tiger parts. Uh, in fact, they took to um, referring to tigers as Toyotas, because that's what you could get if you could get an entire tiger carcass to the border. You could get the equivalent of a Toyota Land Cruiser. So imagine that. Uh, and imagine if you're completely destitute, what that would mean to you. Uh, this fellow Markov had been out hunting with his dogs when he shot and wounded a full-grown male Siberian tiger, also known as Amur tigers. These are big animals. They can weigh five or 600 pounds. Uh, they can jump across this chancel in a single bound. And um, uh, they are the apex predator in their ecosystem. They've been known to kill and eat the Russian equivalent to grizzly bears, uh, which cohabit with them, or try to. Uh, after Markov shot him, the tiger fled, but later he tracked Markov back to his cabin, where he proceeded to find things that had Markov sent on them and chew them to pieces. Then, after marking the perimeter of Markov's uh, property, kind of the tigerine equivalent of yellow police tape. This is mine now. Uh, the tiger lay down and waited. Markov was away searching for his dogs, which had been dispersed by the tiger. And when, and when he returned that evening, armed and ready for a confrontation, the tiger met him head on, disarmed him, killed him, and ate him. But it turned out uh, that this case was an aberration. I interviewed a lot of people over there. They're, they're First Nations people living there uh, and, and imported uh, Western European Russians living side by side in that forest. Uh, the Markov attack was the first of its kind in that valley in living memory. Most people I spoke to uh, there referred to tigers in the face. And they had a saying, the tiger will see you a hundred times before you see her once. And when I asked them, how they handled uh, living with such a creature in the forest, uh, often unarmed, traveling around, um, how they uh, managed just in terms of fear um, and comfort with uh, a stealthy predator that's essentially three times the size of a mountain lion. They said to me, if I don't touch her, she won't touch me. In the Bikin Valley, there was a mutual trust that was borne out by history and experience. And Markov had violated that trust. 
I want to emphasize here that these are not exotic animist tribes people I'm talking about. These are, for the most part, European Russians who look just like most of the people in this room and who share many of our values around education, technology, and progress. So why, I wonder, did they have such a tolerant and nuanced view of tigers? Well, proximity has a lot to do with it, and the more I looked at tigers through these Russians' eyes, the more I saw we had in common. For starters, we grew up together. Tigers are higher mammals, the same age as us. The first tigers were prowling the forests of Asia when our ancestors walked out of Africa more than a million years ago. By the time Homo sapiens arrived on the scene, tigers were well established, and it's fair to say that there's no corner of the Asian consciousness that doesn't have a tiger lurking in it somewhere. And since then, the tiger has become synonymous the world over with power, grace and beauty, and we've adopted it as our own through our logos, flags, sports teams, and even through our medications. Viagra is the Sanskrit word for tiger. One way to measure an animal's intelligence is by its diet, and generally speaking, the more varied the diet, the more intelligent the animal. Uh, like us, tigers are taught what and how to eat by their mothers, and like us, tigers will eat virtually anything, from mice to monkeys and deer to ducks. With the exceptions of deserts and savannah, tigers flourish in every ecosystem we do, from the high alpine to coastal swamps. So once I got past the, the teeth and the stripes, I was able to see that we're both large, adaptable apex predators with good memories, a capacity for vengeance, and the ability to problem solve. Given these fundamental similarities, I wondered what would happen if we used what I'll call the tiger standard, if we looked at the world and our impacts on it through a tiger's lens. Could we learn anything? Well, let's start with resources. A male Amur tiger may manage a territory of 400 square kilometers or more, and he operates under the assumption that everything within his marked boundaries belongs to him. And so far, he sounds like any property owner. The, the big difference is that even though tigers are fully capable of wiping out the prey base, they will kill on average only one large animal per week. And this sense of balance and moderation is instinctive in tigers. So how did we, descended as we are from nomadic scavengers, become so unbalanced? That's a long story, but agriculture and population have a lot to do with it. And for those of us in the West, most of our working attitudes toward nature derive from the Old Testament. Our sense of entitlement, that nature is here to serve us, to accommodate our needs and appetites, whatever they may be, and whatever the cost, finds its purest expression in Genesis. God said to Noah, the original homesteader, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth with yourselves. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. Well, tigers operate with a similar sense of entitlement and superiority. The big difference is that tigers manage to be superior without being separate. In 1926, the head of the Marxist Union of Siberian Writers, now defunct, uh, delivered a lecture in which he said, let the fragile green breast of Siberia be dressed in the cement armor of cities, armed with the stone muzzles of chimneys, and girded with iron belts of railroads. Let the forest be burned and fell. Let the plains be trampled. Only in cement and iron can the brotherhood of all mankind be forged. Well, someone got up here and said that. I don't think she'd get a lot of buy-in, but nonetheless, this is precisely 
what we've done and what we continue to do all over the world. In the end, it's not an Old Testament ideal or a communist ideal or a capitalist ideal. It's what modern humans do. At its root is an ethos of separateness, of exceptionalism. And it's so deeply ingrained in us, we take it for granted. It feels right, normal. But if you were to take a step back and look at the world through the eyes of a tiger, this notion of human exceptionalism looks more like a kind of magical thinking. And there are some real world consequences for believing and acting as we do. Take tigers, for example. In the past century alone, tigers have lost more than 95% of their habitat. And their numbers in the wild have plummeted from an estimated 100,000 at the turn of the last century to barely 3,000 today. As adaptable as tigers are, they haven't adapted to this latest change in their environment. That is, billions of humans vying for the same resources they need, combined with the commodification of their skin bones, and organs. Just imagine if there were seven billion tigers and only 3,000 of us. The world out of balance. Another way of looking at it is that we're currently out-competing tigers the same way we out-competed the Neanderthals 30,000 years ago. Neanderthals were a tough, successful species, just as tigers are. But Homo sapiens are smarter, deadlier, and more successful, at least in the short term. But there's one thing, there's one big difference. When we wiped out the Neanderthals, we didn't also wipe out the ecosystems we both depended on. So what if we return to the tiger standard and we asked ourselves, is our current behavior healthy or sustainable for any? large, entitled, and territorial creature? If the answer is no, then it's probably not healthy or sustainable for humans either. So I just want you to imagine a kind of collage of images of someone selling tiger paws, a rhinoceros horn, a gas well, a computer, a coal mine, a Ferrari, some diamonds, uh, logged off tiger habitat, uh, the tar sands, a million cars, a dead elephant, a Louis Vuitton handbag, uh, tighter gen tiger uh, genitals on a blanket on the sidewalk for sale, gold. All these things that make the world go round one way or another. All of these things clearly have meaning and utility for us. Or we wouldn't value them as we do. What's not clear is the line between value and damage, and beauty, and crime. Tigers have been sacred in Asia for as long as there have been humans. And just like the buffalo among the Plains Indians, or the seal among the Inuit, every part of the tiger is used, is valued and appreciated. But is this healthy or sustainable? There are people who feel they need and deserve bear paw soup or shark fin soup, or tuna fish sandwiches. They might say it's delicious, it's traditional, it's my right, but is this healthy or sustainable? Likewise, we've been burning fossil fuels for a long time now and we've come to depend on them, but they're derived from a series of processes that pollute and poison every single step of the way. And they cause demonstrable, measurable harm to the world at large, to our habitat. So do we have the right to continue doing these things because the Old Testament said so? Because a Marxist said so? Because a politician or a CEO says so? Because it's the status quo at this particular moment in our very short history? Well, who defines the status quo? The market? Our own momentum? Or is it our fear of the effort it will take to change. Another way of framing it, do we, the beneficiaries of these products, reciprocate in any way to the systems and creatures that provide them? 
that keep us alive from day to day. By not holding ourselves to the standards of nature, the standards to which tigers are bound by their own natures, we deny reality. Another name for this is magical thinking, which is what children do. Now, I have two kids at home, and when they were babies, my wife and I waited on them hand and foot. We gave them everything they needed. But now they're older, 10 and 13, and we expect them to pull their weight a little bit, to give something back to the home, to their life support system. With the exception of those who have vested interests in the status quo, we are being encouraged from every quarter to do things differently. The current state of the world is one of ecological crisis. It is the challenge of our time. But I urge you to view these distress signals as invitations, invitations to mature as a society and as a species. One of the best and bravest examples of this I know comes from the Russian Far East. In the late 1930s, Marxist ideology held that any animals not clearly beneficial to mankind were candidates for extermination. Tigers fell into this category of harmful fauna. But when three Russian biologists discovered tiger tracks in a game sanctuary, they decided to take a census, the first of its kind in all of Asia. They were shocked to discover that there were only about 30 of these animals left. They were truly on the verge of extinction, this is around 1940. Uh, at that time, biologists didn't know what role, if any, tigers played in the ecosystem. But these men took it on faith that if the tigers were there, there must be a reason. And they began advocating for tiger protection at one of the most dangerous times in Russian history, when Stalin was executing anyone who appeared to challenge the status quo was during the Great Terror. In spite of this risk, these three men said, harmful or not, we need to stop killing these animals. And it's because of their courage and faith that Soviet Russia, of all places, became the first country to declare the tiger a protected species. Since then, the Amur tiger has made the most successful comeback of any big cat anywhere in the world. I tell you this because one of the simplest and cheapest ways to reciprocate, to manifest our maturity and wisdom as a species, is simply to stop doing harm. What excites me most about the current era is we've never been more capable of facing this supreme challenge, to reciprocate, to reduce harm, to develop ways of powering ourselves and feeding ourselves that don't poison our atmosphere or suck the lifeblood out of our ecosystems. We are the most potent, creative, and adaptable species that has ever lived. And this is our moment. We rule, at least for now. It's no longer a question of ability. We have that in spades. It's going to take something else and something we seem to be forgetting. And tigers can help us remember what that is. In closing, I want to share with you some lessons I learned from tigers about surviving and thriving together on our planet. Number one is be tough. Tigers endure. They don't give up because they can't afford to, because it's not adaptive to succumb to sloth or despair. Two, know your limits. Establish a territory with well-defined boundaries and look after it. Practice stewardship. Three, avoid conflict whenever possible. Fighting is expensive. Number four, don't hold grudges unless someone's trying to kill you. Five, be acutely attuned to your surroundings. Six, take only what you need. Tigers kill to eat, 
not because they can. Seven, don't buy it, be it. Tigers are complete. They don't need accessories. They be flexible and open-minded. Tigers are adaptable problem solvers. Number nine, keep yourself clean, fit, and well-dressed. Ten, have sex with your mate as loudly and as often as possible. Number 11, the hidden one, be brave like the tiger and defend with your whole being the things that keep you alive, that truly nourish you. Thank you very much.